We are happy to have Pat Arabito here for an interview. She comes from California and is the wife of the well-known Jim Arabito. Now we would like to hear something about her life. Pat, which dreams did you have after high school? Well, I was going to go to college, I was going to get married, I was going to have 12 boys. Yes. <laughs> I was going to live in the same house forever with a nice yard and a happy life. Okay. Oh, I was going to drive an Audi too. Okay. <laughs> But how did your life um, develop? Well, not like I dreamed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I went to school. In fact, I, I have a master's degree in marriage counseling but I didn't end up doing marriage counseling. Okay. I had four children instead of 12 boys, three boys and one girl. Uh, okay. And my youngest boy is probably worth about five or six boys in one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Then you have a lot of work Yeah, to it's not a lot of boys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, tell us something about your husband and his hobby. Okay, my husband was an artist, and he did artwork for a living, but he really loved evangelism. And he was often giving lectures and studying history to be able to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. Sometime along the way, someone shared with him a book about Sabbath history. And then he began sharing that in his meetings as well. And we were so amazed at the response from people. Yes, and you also lost a part of your family? Yes. Um, out of that research on Sabbath history, it became his dream to produce a documentary series that traced the Sabbath all the way through history. And for one of the trips, collecting information, he went up to Alaska. There was a story in Alaska about an Eskimo who God had spoken to in the 1800s and taught him about the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So he went to Alaska to interview people about that story. And he was able to take our two oldest sons with him for that trip. Our, our oldest son was 13, his mm. name was Tony, and then Joey was 11, and they were really excited to get to go to Alaska with their dad. They loved nature, and they were interested in seeing the caribou and the elk and going fishing and just seeing the beautiful Alaska countryside. They were up there for 10 days, and um, they had to fly in a small plane to get to the village where they were and then fly back in the small plane to... Anchorage to catch the flight home. As they were flying home, it was late at night, and the pilot was a native Alaskan, and there was also another lady on the plane, and a storm blew up. The pilot evidently thought that he could fly under the storm and get mm -hmm. in, because he wasn't too far away from Anchorage at that time, mm -hmm. but the, the storm blew him off course. And he, he did radio in for help and asked if he could go up, but mm -hmm. it was too late, evidently. Oh. And the plane never made it to Anchorage. Oh. And when did you hear it? You know, it was a Sunday night when they were flying there and they were supposed to land in Los Angeles on Monday, mm -hmm. but they didn't come off the plane. So I phoned up to our friends in Alaska who owned the little plane and said, You know, they're not on their flight. What happened? And mm -hmm. that's when I found out that their little plane had never made it to the airport in Anchorage. And at that time, the weather was still bad, and they haven't been able to go out and find the plane. It took them till the next day on Tuesday before search and rescue was able to find the plane. And um, there were no survivors. Oh, this was a big shock for you, I think. And how did you get along with, with this burden? Well, it was hard because I, I really thought they would be okay. I believed that God was guiding Jim in his work mm -hmm. and that it would be God's plan to produce a documentary <clears throat> about Sabbath history. Mm -hmm. And already God had opened some doors and provided the means and made it possible for Jim to get to countries that were hard to get to. You know, there was lots of evidence that God was guiding for that project. Mm -hmm. And also, my other two children who were home with me ha and I had been praying for the whole time they were gone that they would be safe and have a safe return. Mm -hmm. So it was my youngest children, Andy, who was seven, and Adel, who was almost nine, mm -hmm. who were home with me. And, and how did, did they get along with this? You know, it's even hard to understand how you can have someone alive this moment and not alive the next moment. Yes. 
you know, and to hear the news, um, I, I can't even really explain how it was. My, my brother found the news out and he came and told me himself. Evidently, usually the sheriff's department brings you bad news like that, but mm -hmm. they were having trouble finding someone to come to my house. So my brother called them and they told him and he came. And by this time, my house was full of friends mm -hmm. waiting to hear the news. And my, I was outside and I came in and my children, you know, just looked at me. They probably could tell by looking at me. And my son said, my daddy's dead, isn't he? And, you know, I had to agree that it was true. Mm. So it was, you know, probably the hardest moment of our lives. Mm. And I always thought that God would not let me lose a child mm. because I took that promise in Corinthians, you know, where God will not allow you any temptation that's too great for you to bear, but He'll provide a way of escape. Mm -hmm. And I thought from that promise that God knew I couldn't bear to lose a child. And so he wouldn't let me lose a child. Okay. And now I've lost two children and my husband. And I found out that God knows that if he's right here with you, then you bear it because he bears it with you mm -hmm. and in you. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day. God creates the entire world in six days, and then he rests on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is, though, a creation in and of itself, because what it does is put the rest of the six days in perspective. The commandment to observe the Sabbath every seventh day, the longest of all the Ten Commandments, was preserved with the other nine on stone tablets and placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Individuals today are in great need of finding a sanctuary in time, which is what the Sabbath is. Pope John Paul II, in his apostolic letter, Dies Domini, suggests that the Sabbath recalls that the universe and history belong to God. In more than 100 ancient and modern languages, the seventh day of the week was named Sabbath, or its equivalent. As we increase our knowledge of the past, as we unravel its mysteries, the outlines of our history become more and more distinct. From caves and burial sites, from stony cliffs that were once cities and towns, from the wrecks and ruins of long lost tribes and nations, there emerge new clues to broaden our understanding of the human story. So God was a great help for you in this time. Yeah, I was, there was a sense of His presence with us. And I felt like some people think that if bad things happen to you, God must be gone. Mm -hmm. But I felt that God was there more fully than ever before. And that my grief was His grief. And our pain was His pain. And our loss was His loss. And He was suffering it with us. And your children, how did they get along with this? Is hard. there belief in God that yes. she can do something like this? Or? <laughs> it was hard for them because, well, for my daughter, she said to me very shortly, she says, Mom, I'm so glad you're not the kind of person that blames God for everything. Mm. And I, I thought, she must feel God's presence too. Mm. My son was thinking, we prayed for their safe return and God didn't bring them back safely. Why? Mm. And for my son, he thought, um, he thought maybe God didn't like him. If God let this happen to him, maybe God doesn't like me. Or maybe I'm just so bad that God couldn't do something good for me. Mm -hmm. You know, he really struggled with those questions. And for help, we just went to the Bible. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wanted people to read promises to me right then. That was the kind of help I needed. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, when my son expressed these things, We'd go to the Word and we'd read all the promises about the resurrection. We memorized oh, okay. all the promises about the resurrection and all the promises about God forgiving our sins and all the promises about how much God loves us because it was the only help I could think of for the agony of their hearts. And what are your children doing now? Well, they've grown up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That was 1990, so it's almost okay. 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. My daughter is almost 26 now. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
she married last year, last summer, and her husband oh. is pastoring three churches. Mm -hmm. And they both have a passion for mission. They will go to, to a mission field? They will. She's already lived in the mission field. She lived in Albania and Nepal and in the Philippines. Ah, She's a nurse. Okay. And they want to go again. They really love going to places where there are all not yet any Christians. Uh -huh. They like to, to live in primitive areas. Uh -huh, okay. In the Philippines, she lived in a little grass house that was built by the village, and okay. she ran a little clinic there, and she enjoyed that. Uh, how long did she live there? She was there three different times for, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half altogether. Okay. And my son <coughs> is in the military. He's in the Navy and uh, Special Forces. This is um, also a difficult <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah, my kids are both on the edge kind of people. Okay. <laughs> they both are a little bit extreme. They like adventure and they like challenges. Okay. <laughs> so he's got two more years in the military yet. And he still has some of those same questions that he had as a child. And what about um, the project Jim began? I knew that God would finish it. I believed that it was God's plan. And I believe that God would use someone to do it. And if I'm willing, he would use me to help with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I didn't know how to do it. And I don't have the same abilities that my husband had. He was an artist and he was a public speaker and he was okay. very gifted. But I prayed that God would send people who knew how to do it. And in the meantime, I knew that I could do the research. Mm -hmm. He had all the information in his head. Oh, okay. And he hadn't filed any of it. We didn't even have Nothing. a computer. Oh, okay. So there were some notes and there were some drawings that he did, but there was no documentation for anything. And he had drawn a big storyboard of about 500 and some little pictures that showed the people and the places and the events and how it was to go. Mm -hmm. So I started from the storyboard finding the people and the places and the stories and you know, filing all the information in the computer. And I just built, over eight years, I built the information and wrote a rough draft of a script. But did I'm not a script writer either. <laughs> did you also travel to collect the information? At that time, no. Okay. I just went to books. Okay. And one book led me to another book, and that book would lead me to more books. And so I was gathering. And so often, just directly in answer to prayer, God would provide the documentation that I needed or lead me to books that I could find material in. Then you collect um, this material for the television? Right. Yeah. The goal of it is a professional documentary for a secular audience that we could play on commercial television. To some Christian leaders, it made sense to take advantage of the popularity of Sunday, especially since Sunday observance would make Christianity more attractive to the pagans who already worshiped the sun on that day. For example, the Roman Emperor Constantine was, like Aurelian and Diocletian before him, a worshiper of the sun. He was the first emperor to profess belief in Christianity. It was during a crusade against his rivals that he was supposedly converted to Christianity. Sympathetic biographers claim that before a climactic battle near Rome, Constantine saw a vision of a flaming cross in the sky. He credited this vision with his subsequent victory and declared himself to be a Christian. Historians debate whether or not Constantine's conversion was genuine since he maintained his pagan superstitions throughout much of his reign. He consented to baptism only as he lay on his deathbed. Still, his reign did mark a dramatic turning point in the history of Christianity. In 313, with the agreement of his co-emperor Licinius, he effectively legalized the Christian religion. And how long does it take to finish the documentary? Oh, a long time. It was 1987 when my husband first had the idea and took the first trip to gather material for it. Okay. Then 1990 when he died, and then it was 1998 by the time I actually had a rough draft of a script. And all this time I was praying that God would send someone who knew how to produce it well 
and a narrator and a script writer because I don't have those gifts. And my did husband, you find this person? Well, God sent them, yeah. My oh. husband always prayed for a million dollars for the project, and I used to think, we don't need a million dollars. <laughs> what do we need a million dollars for? But uh, after I had hired a producer for it, I said, please give me a budget. And he said, yeah, I think this is a million dollar project. Oh. And I said, yes. <laughs> In actuality, it was more than that, quite a bit more than that, because we wanted to do it professionally and not have to um, make bad decisions because we didn't have enough money to do it. So mm -hmm. we just prayed that God would provide the means, and he did. So we started production in 1999, mm -hmm. and uh, every year we finished one until in 2005 the whole set was finished. I have the finished set here. Oh, wow. Finally. <laughs> God did it. Each part um, covers a different time period in history from Eden all the way to Eden Restored. And we produced it both in Spanish and English to begin with, and then we have um, in the works a lot of other translations. In fact, we're working on a German translation right now. It'll be dubbed, and the Adventist Media Center here in Germany is doing the dubbing for the German. Oh. We also have already recorded the voices for the Arabic version. Mm -hmm. French version is being recorded right now. There's Portuguese and Russian already translated, ready to record. Um, Romanian, Danish, Dutch, um, oh, and Mandarin also is ready to be recorded right now. So we hope to have it in every major language because the Sabbath is an international subject. Yes. We also want to broadcast it. We didn't design this just for home use. Yes. We designed it using a well-known person as our host for the purpose of putting it on commercial television. And once it's translated, there's no reason why it can't be on television in every one of the countries that it's translated into. And I believe the time is coming when the Sabbath issue will be agitated and people will want to know why Sabbath or why Sunday. And then they'll have this as a tool for that time. In the second century, the first day of the week, the Day of the Sun, became a popular day of worship for some Christians. In spite of the popularity of sun worship and the Sunday laws of emperors, many Christians continued to worship on the seventh day Sabbath. In fact, Christian churches that abandoned the Sabbath were in the minority. But that didn't last. Sunday became an established part of Christian worship. The minority who kept the seventh day suffered through dark times of trial and persecution, but eventually interest in the Bible Sabbath revived. The matter is clear. It takes only our own records of days and weeks to make an end of the argument. It is the seventh day, the Sabbath of creation, that we need to keep holy. 